with the kind uh, consent and permission of uh, our principal dr shoma ghosh and uh, the kind consent of uh, the principal of uh, minanini dotto mahavidyalay dr apurva kumar uh, bandhopadhyay may i proceed and begin the session yes uh, on behalf of both the colleges yes may i give the permission to set the session on of, of course madam of course please carry on please carry on okay. thank good. you okay uh, good morning and a warm welcome to all our eminent guest speakers <laughs> dr db subedi university of new england australia dr ganga thapa from university of tribhuvan <laughs> nepal and dr arundhati chakravarti vice principal and the iqsc coordinator of kc college of engineering and management studies and research thani mumbai all luminaries in their respective domain we are extremely honored to be amongst us on this platform of google meet for the motivated international webinar on dynamics of democracy and challenges of governance in new normal i extend my heartfelt thanks to principals of both hiralal majumdar memorial college dakshineshwar and mrinalini datta mahavidyalay birati dr shoma ghosh and dr apurva kumar bandopadhyay for their kind consent and compliance to collaborate and make the webinar a joint endeavor their constant encouragement and leadership has remained a fountain of inspiration for us to club together and make the event a reality today i thank the iqsc team of both the colleges the political science departments of Hiralal Majumdar Memorial College and Mrinalini Dattu Mahavidyalay and all other staff who engaged themselves relentlessly for the webinar I also feel honored and privileged to welcome all participants friends colleagues and dear students who thought of attending the program despite their very busy schedules i confess without you the webinar could not be possible added to it i am immensely indebted to all those technical hands especially ms atray bhattacharya faculty member of history department of our college and ms pooja das faculty member of computer science of our hirala uh, Majumdar Memorial College for women who shouldered the responsibility of putting little yet important things together that finally led to the event this morning. Well, this is the first session uh, that has already begun at eleven, and it shall continue till uh, one fifteen uh, p.m. roughly. The second session shall commence from five p.m. and continue till seven. where we shall have another round of luminaries in academics dr anand mitra uh, professor of communication at wake forest university winston salem usa we have dr shobhanal datta gupta uh, retired sn banerjee chair professor department of political science university of calcutta and uh, we have dr rumki basu uh, from jamia millia university new delhi so uh from the core of my heart once again i confess we are overwhelmed to have your august presence with us this morning in our endeavor to engage ourselves into pedagogic exercises with crude realities regarding the new normal scenario we all are battling with to stay alive and keep going adjusting and accommodating to changes constantly staring at us well the theme today is as we all know dynamics of democracy and challenges of governance in new normal 
Uh, it's quite a common phenomenon huh? that uh, countries across the world experience frequent and rapid changes in their economies, which impacts, yes, administrators and institutions adhering to it, and of course, associated values of their citizens. But the question is, how do we measure such changes? Normally, there are common dynamics on how countries develop in terms of economy, democracy, and cultural values. Uh, the dynamics underlying these changes is not linear, but it is non-linear. It is uh, observed that the HDI, that is the Human Development Index of a country, generally drives uh, democracy first and then higher emancipation of citizens. Changes occur when nations pass a certain threshold of that HDI. A high level of democracy and emancipation entails a tilt towards a kind of uh, equilibrium that refuses to support further economic growth. Now, securing human rights and promoting democratization process boosts emancipative values. This is perhaps one reason why more and more countries are now subscribing to democratic regimes with higher levels of civil liberties, of course, despite huge differences amongst them in cultural, economic, and political domain. Uh, more is the educational uh, sprawl and uh, better is the standard of living in different parts of the world, the more people experience existential security with social, economic, political domains ushering multifarious changes in cultural values are catching up with the trend as well. Uh, some years ago in 1950s, SM Lipset provided empirical evidence for positive relation between socioeconomic development and political democratization. We found enough evidence of such relation and we all knew about it. Much later, we found democracy does not grow linearly with the GDP per capita. Instead, we see rapid and sudden democratization. Once GDP per capita has surpassed a certain threshold, if the GDP is below this threshold, economic growth will not cause democratization. On the contrary, nation states with certain level of democracy at initial point, experience a decline in the system with vices like corruption, dishonesty, and all other kinds of pollutants that uh, kills the spirit of democracy. Now, the pandemic has changed governance cadence and focus. At this moment, we find in every sphere there is an overarching priority on health and safety of the workforce. The imperative to aid and support management grew much more. There are much more frequent interaction among the board members between the management and between the employees. The intensity level has ris uh, risen uh, in case of meetings and uh, communication, etc. All, uh, but of course, these meetings and communications are all done virtually which we were not at all uh, accustomed to earlier. A sharpening of focus, intensity in directness, and candor in dialogue is observed. Impact of working remotely on board and company and culture. So uh, there is, uh, again, yes, consistently check the viability of strategy and speed of that decision. So all these are there. The lockdown following the most catastrophic and redefining eon of our lifetime, COVID-19, has given us an opportunity to refurbish our thought and adapt ourselves to accept the new normal. While the world increasingly became digitally collaborative, people-to-people -people connectivity increased enormously. This is perhaps just the tip of the iceberg we are eagerly looking forward to navigate much more from our speakers today. So without further delay, I would prefer the spirit of the webinar be set and the ball be rolling with a welcome address followed by resourceful del deliberations by our speakers. 
wish you all a very safe durga utsav and once again su swagatam to all thank you over to atray bhattacharya faculty member of history uh, hiralal mojumdar memorial college dakshineshwar thank you ma'am it's true now it's the time to set the ball rolling for this webinar i take the opportunity to request dr apurva kumar bandopadhyay sir honorable principal mrinalini dotto mahavidyapet for delivering the welcome address welcome sir over to you thank you thank you madam and hello everyone <clears throat> most welcome to this one day international webinar on dynamics of democracy and challenges of governance in new normal the webinar has been jointly organized by the iqsc and departments of political science of two indian institutes of higher education hiralal mojumdar memorial college for women and mridalini dotto mahavidyapeet west bengal i remain immensely thankful to my dear colleague dr shoma ghosh principal hiralal mojumdar memorial college for women and the learned faculty members of the two colleges for their academic initiative to promote the concept of cluster of institutions in our university in this program it is my privilege to welcome again three honorable speakers of session 1 dr d b shubedi from university of new england australia professor ganga thapa from tribhuvan university nepal and dr arundhuti chakravarti vice principal and iqsc coordinator kc college of engineering and management thane maharashtra we feel sincerely indebted to all the speakers and acknowledge their gracious consent for being with us from far off countries and places i also feel delighted to welcome the learned participants of this webinar most of whom are the dedicated teachers research scholars and students from several institutes of higher education to a layman's perception governance is as old as human civilization and bad governance is one of the root causes of all evil within our societies governance in a social system is deeply interlinked with the dynamics of political democratization throughout the globe principles of good governance often appear to be contradictory whenever the non idealized field of applications are encountered accountability cannot be enforced without transparency and impartial enforcement of rule of law it is true that public administrators are used to navigate their policies through such contradictions but the pandemic scenario has unearthed a paradigm shift to charge the entire ecosystem of governance administrative ethics in pandemic governance need to identify how to strike a balance between two apparent contradictions balancing human life and economy is an example the challenge is to eradicate old mindsets and embrace new solutions today we aspire that the eminent speakers of this international webinar will enlighten us over the concepts of appropriate governance in new normal situations by following which sustainable dimensions of democracy may be strengthened even in such deadly phase of academic pandemic 
At the end, I express my de novo thanks to Dr. Shoma Ghosh and the dedicated teachers of the two sister institutes for organizing this international webinar. Finally, I wish grand success of this webinar and welcome you all once again. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for such a colossal welcome address. I now request Srimati Rishita Pal Choudhury, Assistant Professor, Department of Political Science, Mrinalini Dotto Mahavidya Pit, Berati, to welcome our honorable speaker. We all are waiting to get ourselves introduced to our honorable speaker. Over to you, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. It is my privilege to introduce the first speaker for today's program, Dr. D.B. Subedi. Dr. D.B. Subedi is an interdisciplinary academician specializing in political sociology and peace studies. He is presently working as a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of New England, Australia. Currently, he is working on a three-year research project that aims to understand changing social and political conditions for reducing the threats of neo-nationalism and religious extremism in South Asia. Before joining as a postdoctoral fellow, he worked as a lecturer in the School of Government, Development and International Affairs at the University of South Pacific in Suva, Fiji. He is also a senior fellow at the Center for Security Governance in Canada and a research member in addressing violent extremism and radicalization into terrorism research network in the Deakin University, Melbourne. He has also conducted various research fieldworks in South and Southeast Asia, especially in Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Myanmar. Before going into academics, Dr. Subedi had worked with international organizations for more than 10 years. He has provided consultancy to a number of peace building and developmental agencies like UNDP, UN Women, International Organization for Migration, UNICEF, to name a few. His research interests include nationalism and populism in Asia, religion and violence, countering violent extremism, human rights, migration, as well as globalization and development. He has written extensively in various books and journals of national and international repute. Some of his famous publications include Combatants to Civilians, um, Rehabilitation and Reintegration of Maoist Fighters in Nepal's Peace Process, published by Paul Grave Macmillan, and Reconciliation in Asia Pacific Practices and Insights, published by Springer Nature Singapore. We are extremely happy to have you with us, sir, this morning. Thank you so much, sir, for finding time out from your busy schedule to be with us today. I would now request, sir, to please deliver his lecture. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you, Risita Choudhury. Thank you very much for um, a very elaborate introduction. I really feel honored. Um, can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Great. Thank you very much. And good evening and good afternoon, actually, from Australia. And thanks for having me in this international webinar today. I really feel honored to present and talk in front of esteemed academics and students from India and perhaps from the South Asian region and rest of the world. Uh, first of all, I would also like to extend my best wishes um, on the occasion of what we call uh, in my home country, Nepal, Vijaya Dasami, but I think in the rest of the South Asian region, we call it either Dasera or Durga Puja. So my best wishes to all of you. <clears throat> um, well, when I received an invitation to talk in this webinar, I could not, uh, you know, uh, wait long to say yes because of the title of the topic of this webinar, which is very topical and very timely. Uh, and in fact, uh, we need more of this kind of webinars to understand how this current pandemic is affecting our society, our economy, and our daily lives around the world. 
And given that this topic is really um, uh, important, timely, but also there are different dimensions to democracy and, and, and governance when we look at from the pandemic's point of view. Um, so I will perhaps in my talk today, will not be able to touch on every other important aspects of governance and democratizations, which uh, I believe um, other experienced speakers will probably uh, focus on different aspects to this topic. Um, as we all know, COVID-19 will never be forgotten in human history. And this is simply because most pandemics around the world often get forgotten um, over the time. Uh, we don't know much about Black Death. You know, history has uh, buried these important pandemics of the past somewhere, uh, you know, but this pandemic is really going to be remembered for a long, long time because no other pandemics in human history has stimulated public debate and, and academic debates and discussions from social, political, and economic point of view than COVID-19 of our time. Uh, COVID-19 is also um, important to look at from social and political point of view, um, I would say, is because uh, it's in, in today's globalized world, the world is more globalized now than before uh, because of the rise of internet technology, because of the rise of uh, fast modern uh, communication and, and transportation system. And of course, along with that, the global mobility of human being from one parts of the world to other. And because of this highly interdependent and highly globalized nature of this world, the effects of the effects of this pandemic is actually affecting not just one part of the world, uh, but most, you know, um, it is affecting around the world in different ways. So what I'm going to discuss today in my very short presentation, and I don't know how much I think I'm given like 30 minutes time, is that right? Am I correct? If someone can confirm me, um, if someone can confirm me, if I'm, I have 30 minutes time. Yes. Um, okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm also trying to, I have a small slide here. I don't have many slides, but, uh, sorry. I can't actually show my slides. I have few slides which would actually make this presentation um, it would be helpful for me. Uh, is there any way I can I can share my slides? Yes, sir. To share uh, your slides. I I'm here in the present now button, and is it saying should I share a window or an entire screen? Perhaps I go for entire screen. Is that right? Yes, sir. But it's not giving me a permission. It's not granting me the permission. That's the problem. Sir, just select the uh, dialog box which is opening. Mm -hmm. Just select this, click on the screen and click on the share option. Okay. Um, give me a second. Sorry for this technical. Uh, no, I can't do it. Anyway. I don't want to kill the time. I want to go without the slides. Okay. So I would like to start with um, making a quick observation on, uh, you know, how this COVID-19 is affecting our world at, you know, political, economic, and social levels. Uh, before COVID-19 hit us in December last year, the world there has been already. Uh, you know, very many important social and political changes happening in, in the world. Basically, as we understand, in the last 10 years, uh, since, you know, um, 
Samuel Huntington framed this idea of third wave of democracy. We know that in the post Cold War era, more and more countries were turning to be democratic country by means of the number of elections, by means of number of elected parliaments and so and so forth. But at least, uh, you know, after 2015 and particularly with the, the election of Donald Trump in the United States and Brexit movement in the UK and the rise of right-wing populist party in Western Europe, there has been um, a very powerful um, authoritarian nationalism, uh, nationalist and populist movements that's happening in the world today. And this is not a very old phenomena because as I said, it only started in uh, last five to seven years. Although the history of populism in the world is, is also very old, starting from 18th century populist, agrarian populist movement in uh, United States and then left-wing populist movement in uh, Latin America, for example. But with the rise of this right-wing politics in Western Europe, and the simultaneous and subsequent rise of populist political movement in Western Europe, the effect has also been spread all over the world. And even in the Asian context, we can see that in the last several years, there has been a political tendency, there has been a shift towards um, authoritarian, nationalist, and populist modes of government and governance system. I'll come back to this point in a minute. Um, so what's happening with the with the um, effects of pandemic is that pandemic is actually going, it is impacting on uh, the system of governance uh, and making governments looking more authoritarian and more populist and more undemocratic in that sense. So as an effect of this right-wing politics, nationalist government and authoritarian forms of government, that is actually what I call a, a new movement, political movement around the world. And this movement can be best described as a counter liberalism movement. Because we know one of the achievements of the social and political history around the world, particularly after the Second World War, is the rise of uh, you know, liberal democratic system. Liberal democratic system basically you know, relies on the idea of uh, universalism of liberal values and principles, uh, and it also primarily relies on uh, neoliberal economic policies, capitalism, and globalization, globalization as, uh, as a vehicle of liberal values, taking them around the world. With the rise of authoritarian and populist governments in the West, as well as in the East, or so-called global South, there is a new tendency, what I said, what I called counter-liberalism. So what does counter-liberalism -liber means? Counter-liberalism means there is a tendency to deny liberal political values, liberal democratic values at the expense of taking over, uh, taking authoritarian modes of government and governance systems. And this as an effect of cumulative effects of right-wing politics and, and, and counter-liberalism discourse, there is also a very modest kind of counter-globalization movement that was already happening before COVID-19. When I say counter-globalization movement, I would mean that, I mean, for liber liberal democracy to function, which depends on the idea of mutual cooperation, mutual interdependence between states and among the states at an international level, there is also, because of the nationalist politics that's happening around the world, there is this new discourse of counter-globalization. So now globalization is in a way, you know, uh, which has been a driving force for social, political, and economic changes in many countries. For example, because of globalization now, you can find, you know, na nationalities of almost every country in countries like Australia, UK, or Canada. And their economic growth, to a large extent, is driven by uh, migration, which is a resultant phenomena of globalization, uh, for example. But there is a very powerful and oftentimes very violent 
anti-immigration movements that we have seen in Western Europe along the rise of um, you know, um, uh, populist nature of politics, right-wing politics in Western Europe. And countries now, all of a sudden, are now looking inside their borders rather than thinking of cooperations at a global scale. For example, when D Donald Trump in his 2015 election, when he, when he talked about making America great again, the emphasis was on nationalism, the emphasis was on a kind of right-wing populism, but the implicit emphasis was also on the idea of counter-globalization. Because when you start looking at your own country, for some good reasons, in some cases with some bad intentions whatsoever, when every country in the world starts looking at their own territory only with their people and within the country certain kind of people that creates a kind of a new movement and that we can call as counter globalization so these three kind of movements authoritarian right wing populism politics counter liberalism and counter globalizations what is going to happen in the post covid world is that as an effects of covid 19 COVID-19 is going to actually accelerate this process. So, um, and we need to take into these things into account because what I just talked about different kind of international system is actually going to, uh, going to have profound effect on the way we, we understand democracy, the way we understand uh, governance. I'll come back to the question of governments uh, in a while. In the meantime, I'm, I just talk about the macro level political change at, at an international level, in the international order. But that's not only where the changes has actually stopped, because the changes that's happened at an international system and systemic level also has knock-on effects and trickle-down effects on how people, how different cultural groups how different religious groups and how different ethnic groups and social groups, they interact to each other. As a result of, um, as a result of the nationalist politics, populist politics now, certain group that have, there has been a tendency of growing alienations between social groups, you know, for example, the interactions between Muslim immigrants and white Europeans, for example, is not happening in the same pace and same scale what it used to be in the past. Even in South Asia, for example, over the last decade or so, we have seen, uh, you know, social tensions are emerging between um, religious and cultural groups th than in the past. Because even if you look at the history of India, for example, the decades of 1960s, 50s, and 70s was the, the decades of social mobilization and political mobilization based on class interest, for example. The agrarian movement in India is, is a good example of how uh, post-independence India mobilized social and political forces based on class interest. Nepal is another country where the left-wing uh, uh, political movement, which was finally taken over by radical Maoist, was to some extent originally based on class interest, but then over the time it has taken over by, uh, you know, um, some other social and political elements to it. For example, the ethno ethno nationalist movement movements based around 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 the idea of caste, around the idea of ethnicity, around the idea of social and political inclusions have become powerful elements and powerful force in shaping politics in different countries. So. Actually, when, you know, when a pandemic of this scale hits the society and where there are only resource, uh, you know, these countries already have uh, experiencing resource scarcity, it is quite likely that it is going to promote some kind of very narrow, uh, you know, um, ethnicity-based um, interest as opposed to a broader societal and collective social actions that we used to see in the past. So my point here is that as an effect of um, COVID-19, we, we have already seen and we will continue to see in the post-COVID world and in the so-called new normal that collectivism that once used to underpin the idea of social solidarity, underpin the idea of democracy, underpin the idea of inclusion is going to be under crisis.
And what does that mean? I mean, obviously we have seen, um, you know, uh, there have been uh, very powerful uh, social movements and protests around the world because of the economic effects of pandemic. Because until recently, uh, and just before the pandemic, we, we also had, uh, you know, SARS problem, swine flu, and so and so forth. And the governments from around the world, even the democratic government, not just authoritarian government, liberal is as well as illiberal governments, mostly saw this kind of, um, you know, uh, swine flu, um, and the, uh, the kind of um, problems as a uh, problem of health, as well as to some extent a, a problem of security. I mean, human security, but also national security. But this COVID-19 is, is an economic crisis, is a social crisis, but it's also a political crisis. So if we consider economic crisis for the moment, then what it means is that, that it, is re it is certainly going to uh, impact negatively on horizontal inequality that has been existing in our societies for a long, long time. Because uh, even uh, inequality even exists in the developed country. I'm not making a point here that our countries in South Asia, for example, India, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh, uh, we have high degree of inequality. But inequality is not just confined within the nation state because we have seen that at an international level, there is a very, um, dire situations of um, global inequality because today um, uh, the less than 10 percent of well, 10 percent of people in the world possesses more than half of the world's wealth um, as opposed to 90 percent people who actually even do not possess half of the uh, world's wealth so that is the research um, the, uh, the the indicators uh, uh, actual percentage of the people in the top 10% might be slightly more or less, but we have seen for the last decade that global inequality has increased. So while there is already this global inequality, it is certainly will be the case that, you know, the, uh, the vaccine war that we have seen already, um, uh, uh, even if the vaccine, uh, anti, you know, COVID-19 vaccine has not yet been produced in the world, the vaccine war is actually going to increase the global inequality and lack of economic opportunities at the very local level is going to increase horizontal inequality. So what does that mean? I mean, I'm also a student of peace and conflict studies. So my prediction, and which I'm still uh, watching very carefully in the Asia Pacific, Indo-Pacific region, that the post COVID world is going to experience more conflict. In some places it, it might experience violent conflict conflict over resources, conflict over identity, conflict over power, but in other places it's going to impact on, uh, it, it might be even more violent conflict. So as a result of this macro and micro and meso level social and political changes this COVID-19 is going to impact on, it will ultimately, uh, it will ultimately uh, affect on how we understand democracy, how governments actually fulfill their democratic commitment, and how people build their trust to the democratic and public institutions. Because if we, if we think of governance, I mean, government, governance is an old idea, but in its modern form, the idea of governments get more popularity and get uh, become a vital element of statehood and state system since the formation of modern nation states in some hundred years ago. Because at the center of the idea of governance is the view that uh, there is a certain kind of relationship between people and then the state institutions. And that the relationship between people and the state institutions. Or in other words, we could say that the relationship between people and um, you know, uh, in other words, we could also say state society relationship. In the modern nation state system, the role and function of governance as a political, ideological, but also as a moral philosophy and framework is to mediate the relationship between state and society. With the potential scenario that COVID-19 is going to impact on it, international political level, economic level, and social levels, what we can anticipate, unfortunately and, and ironically, is that um, 
the pandemic is going to actually directly impact on how people will develop their trust to public institutions. And this is where I see it as a major problem because um, how much time do I have, by the way? Because I don't want to take more. Can someone confirm me? I didn't I forget to look at the watch. OK, fine. Um, all right. OK, I think I won't. I, next five minutes will be fine, I guess. <laughs> In terms of time management, I'm not that good. Um, so what I was talking about is the trust. Because of the impact of um, uh, COVID-19, the resultant effect at the level of state and society is the crisis of trust between public and the state institutions. And excuse me, excuse me, Professor Thapa, did you say something? OK, all right, yeah. I saw you moving your hands. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so the trust at institution level. So the, the, sorry? When it comes to the question of trust between state system, state and society, the generally held perception before the before COVID-19 was that so-called developed countries or the first world countries uh, are able to manage this public trust through the strong institutions they have. And countries in the developing world or I would rather call them countries in the global south, they have weaker uh, or even unconsolidated democracy, weak bureaucratic apparatus, fragmented politics, so and so forth. And because of that, there is a weaker level of public trust. But COVID-19 actually have changed that mindset. You know, uh, I, I'm here in Australia and uh, one would imagine that, you know, Australia is managing very well in terms of managing COVID-19. I mean, it mobilized, um, state system effectively. However, uh, just few few weeks before in Melbourne, there were protests against the government because the lockdown that, that was enforced by the uh, Victoria government, um, the people didn't like it. Uh, people were having extremely difficult, um, uh, difficult experience in terms of uh, their livelihood, income, so and so forth. So the point I want to make here is that when it comes to the uh, you know, weakening of trust between the state and society, the, the pandemic actually exposed the weakness and vulnerability of the government and government institutions, system, and the system of governance disproportionately around the world. Be it United States of America, be it, you know, India, or be it Singapore, there is a degree of vulnerab vulnerability which has been exposed. So, what does that degree of vulnerab vulnerability of political system, bureaucratic system, and governance system uh, that we come to know from this? Uh, and one reason why this has been exposed is because no government in the world was institutionally, politically, and even morally prepared to face a pandemic of this scale. No government in the world. So as a result of that, now, one of the biggest challenges from the governance point of view, um, in my perspective, is to restore that trust, which is so central to the idea of democracy, so central to the idea of people and the state. What, what the government, how the governments are responding to that kind of, um, uh, that kind of uh, weakening of trust. Because if we look at country like Australia, for example, I live in New, New South Wales, somewhere 500 kilometers away from Sydney. But we have a feeling in Australia that I live in a different country, not in Australia, you know, because we, we have a feeling that you, you are not allowed to go to um, Melbourne or you're not allowed to go to Brisbane, for example, because Australia has a federal system and federal entities has the power and authority to restrict on their border, control their border. From the local governance point of view, in a way that's good, but if we look at, you know, people are missing their families, people have not been able to attend funerals, and there is a kind of anger, there is a kind of, um, there is a kind of anger that is directed against the governments, even in, us, uh, in a country like Australia. In a country like Philippines, for example, in Quezon City, in April, there were 
heavy protest by people who were um, uh, who who had extreme difficulties, um, you know, uh, uh, socioeconomic difficulties because they lost job and government did not provide any social security and social protection system. So, anti-government protest has become a new norm within the new norm. If you look at around the world, there has been anti-government protest, anti-lockdown protest, to be more precise, in India. There has been anti-government and anti-lockdown um, uh, uh, protest in UK, Europe, Southeast Asia, Africa, all around the world. Uh, and how governments are trying to manage that? Governments are trying to manage that doing two things. One, they are trying to adopt a highly distributive economic policies, especially in countries where there are adequate resources. So this distributive policies, what I mean by distributive policies is that in several places, social protection system has been revisited and then if government has enough resources when there is an established system of social protection government is providing support to the people in a way that has been very useful for example in australia the job keepers payment job seeker payment which is the special support economic support provided but directly by the government to uh, to the employers and people who lost jobs because of COVID-19 has been useful. But in other places like India, Nepal, Bangladesh, all other countries you name in South Asia, they do not have enough resources and the co countries have not been able to um, provide that kind of um, uh, social protection system and they, have, they do not have effective distributive and redistributive system in place. As a result of that, how this government is trying to prove their legitimacy when legitimacy challenged in anti-lockdown, anti-government protest by the centralization of power. And this is where democratic system and government system is going to be heading to a very dangerous domain. Uh, just perhaps you may be aware that in Hungary, um, um, in April earlier this year, the parliament passed a special law which would provide Prime Minister Viktor Orban unlimited power centralized in his hand. And the most worrying part of this new legislation in Hungary was that there is no particular time frame given to Viktor Orban. So by using pandemic as a, as a, as a cover, Viktor Orban has centralized power, unlimited power on his hand, and there is no time limit, which means that he can use that power as long as he becomes a prime minister. In other words, he can always become prime minister by using that power, for example. You could also get this example from Sri Lanka, for example. In Sri Lanka, the, the President Rajapakshe, Gothabe Rajapakshe mobilized the military as opposed to mobilizing the, mobilizing the, uh, the health workers, for example, at the, at the highest level to manage and, and uh, to manage the lockdown. And he actually suspended parliament for a long time before, I mean, recently uh, Sri Lanka had this uh, parliamentary election and new government is in place. But if you look at for a certain period of time, the parliament was unconstitutional. The president's move was unconstitutional because he did not, he suspended uh, the parliament in the cover of managing and addressing and responding COVID-19, but at the same time, uh, he also, um, he is also proposing um, new amendment to the constitution, which will provide him unlimited power. And the examples goes in on and on. So my concluding thought is that the biggest challenge from the democracy and, and governance point of view as an as effect of COVID-19 is the, the deterioration of trust of public in the government institutions, which is dangerous. As a response, governments are trying to address that by centralizing power in certain political leader. And they are doing this because they want to A, prove legitimacy and B, survive in the power. If that continues even post-COVID world, it is likely that post-COVID world that we are going to see in future will be more authoritarian more nationalist, more right-wing politics, and democratic 
values, practice, norms, especially liberal democratic values, practice, and norms, which we have seen and many people see this as an achievement of the uh, human civilization and modern political history will be seriously challenged in the post COVID-19 world. I think I should, I, I, I know I took long time more than pretty much, but uh, I wanted to come to this point with some examples. Uh, my, my apology, my sincere apology if I take more time, uh, but I will be happy to answer any other questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Subedi, uh, for your enriching and enlightening lecture. It was extremely uh, and very relevant and pertinent lecture. And uh, above all, the way you have explained the issues and challenges governments are facing worldwide, trying to offer effective governance to its people during these trying times is truly commendable. It was indeed an excellent and comprehensive lecture filled with so many relevant information. Truly, it has deepened our understanding about the present day governance. And I guess there's one question I can see uh, on screen. Uh, okay. This is by uh, Pradipto Mukherjee. Yeah. And he is asking, uh, Dr. Subedi, is there any possibility that counter neoliberal policy can develop distributive system through centralized government institutions? Um. That's a very good question, actually, uh, uh, Pradipta Mukherjee. Um, neoliberal policy, I agree with you. We have seen neoliberal li liberal policies um, governments are adopting in since 19, uh, at least 70s, 80s, and India adopted in 1980s. And uh, to a certain extent, I would say even large extent, neoliberal policies has become a problem. Uh, what has been a problem, uh, I agree, you know, um, uh, there has to be some kind of alternative to neoliberal policy because it's responsible for creating uh, inequality within the state, but also creating inequality at the global stage, you know, at the international stage. But the thing is, there has not been a viable alternative because of political system, but also because of the neoliberal system has such an entrenched uh, you know, influence and its tentacles have been so much expanded all over the world that there is not um, right now, um, even like countries like India um, will, will take some time to actually give up neoliberal policies, you know, because Modi's government, uh, let me, let me uh, put you this way, uh, the government of Narendra Modi, BJP's government is actually um, pursuing um, a different kind of uh, nationalist politics looking at within the nation state. But in, in a way, um, it's uh, political policies, uh, political ideology, political views based on the idea of nationalism, which doesn't really fit with the idea of internationalism. But if we look at, look at the economic system in India, it is still based on the idea of internationalism because it, it follows neoliberal economic policy. So at the political level, most of these countries I talked about are taking sort of nationalist politics with nationalist outlooks. But at the same time, in economic terms, I can give you an example of Philippines, for example. They are still actually pursuing this neoliberal policy. So political and economic outlooks and ideologies are actually contradicting. There is one problem, but of course we uh, we uh, we have to find a viable redistributive system, uh, the system that benefits to all, and that will particularly be much more uh, important and necessary in the post-COVID world. Because as I said, post-COVID world is going to it has already increased inequality. So we need more social protection. We need more social justice. That market alone cannot do the justice. Market functions its own brutal system. And as a result of that, if we leave again, everything to be fixed by the market alone, then probably that will do more harm than doing any good. I hope I answered your question. If you have any, follow-up questions, I will just leave my email address 
in this chat box um, now and then you can always send me email and ha I'm happy to discuss that. I can see there are few more questions. Do you yes, want me sir, to address them quickly? Question. Yes. Yeah. Sir, so should I read it out to you? No, I can read them okay. actually. Yes. Uh, um, what is the difference between Australia and India on some key statistics of COVID-19? Okay, good question. Um, perhaps the most glaring and most um, prominent statistical difference is the number of um, infected people. India is probably, I don't know where it is today, but just a few days back, I, I just got updated and it's probably number one and number two in terms of the number of affected people. So Australia only uh, did not have that label. And the reason why Australia did not have that number of, um, uh, you know, uh, infected people is very hard and very stringent lockdown and timely lockdown. So that is one very important difference in terms of the effects of uh, COVID-19. But then more than that, I think there are more similarities because gender-based violence has increased because of COVID-19 in Australia as well. So is the case in India, for example. Um, the other, other statistical difference is probably and this is what I find rather um, bewildering and, and also not so much surprising as well. In uh, India, I have seen there is a reverse migration because of COVID-19. Because until COVID-19, there was the perception that the urban space, so-called industrial urban space, was seen as a liberator of poverty and a liberator and emancipator of um, all kind of socioeconomic ills of the people. As a result of that, people from rural India, almost every country in Asia, migrated to um, the industrial areas in the urban, urban spaces. But because of this COVID-19, we have seen, you know, uh, the, the, the workers from India, for Delhi, for example, and they, uh, we, uh, that came to a news that they walked, I don't know how many days to return to the villages. So as a result of COVID-19, what we have seen in most Asian countries is the reverse cycle, reverse migration. It's been now the migration is taking a different course and people are now moving from urban areas to rural areas because the, for the obvious reason, because still rural area provides much more social capital in times of crisis and make people more resilient to face this kind of crisis as opposed to the urban spaces where more kind of individualism rather than collectivism rules the norm, right? So these, but in Australia, it wasn't the case, you know, like people did not really leave Melbourne, Sydney and return to villages. It's still Australia is actually struggling to, um, you know, address the low, uh, population growth in rural areas, but this did not happen uh, unlike India. So these are some of the things, but you know, um, uh, I'm also not an uh, expert on statistics, by the way, um, you know, but that's a good question. I hope I answered it to some extent. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. There's another question by Joyanto Devnath. And uh, he's asking what actions have been really effective in taking tackling COVID-19 in Australia? What actions? Oh, good question. Uh, okay. The first of all, as I said, uh, early lockdown. And, you know, because as I said, you know, Australia is a federal state. And the state authorities in each state are given um maximum power at the time of emergency like this uh to activate their special power and authority and take actions to address this kind of problem so early lockdown has become very effective um having said that there were some lapses and which actually uh is is currently being investigated for example um uh, uh, see there was um uh, a, a a SIP was people from a SIP in Sydney, which arrived in the har in Sydney Harbour, uh, were allowed to, um, uh, you know, uh, come out and enter the city without being um, screened, for example. Uh, as a result of that, 
uh, it is what I'm talking about somewhere in May, June. Uh, the state where I live in, New South Wales, had very high number of uh, community infections because of the people uh, who were infected and they came out without being um, screened. Um, and the authorities actually, there was a sort of a coordination gap between health authorities, border control authorities, and so and so forth. The other lapses you might have seen is that um, uh, the management of uh, self-isolation in a hotel was given to the private sector and, and there were some lapses and um, uh, the quarantine in hotel was not up to that standard and then uh, Victoria which where is the, you know with its uh, headquarters in Melbourne had the uh, very big second wave in Australia so there were some lapses and the good thing about the governance system here is these cases have been thoroughly investigated, are currently being investigated, and people right from the, uh, you know, someone who is equivalent to chief minister in India's case to every responsible government authorities have been interrogated, and uh, there is a very serious investigation. But I doubt in country like India, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Pakistan, Bangladesh, or in other Asian countries, I doubt there has been any um, such investigations, even public know that there has been glaring lapses. So the investigation, early action, strict lockdown, and more importantly, I would want to conclude by saying this, is people actually listen to the government's appeal. One, I mean, I'm not, I'm not actually in a mood I don't want to blame the people to the public because public have done their best. You know, the government asked them to stay in lockdown. People did, despite the fact that some even did not have nothing to eat, nothing to cook. But people have obeyed that, you know. But still, if we compare between country like Australia and India, I mean, well, we can't really compare it because these two countries come from different social background, cultural and different traditions and different systems. Um, but what I see is that uh, to some extent, people in Australia also obey and, and listen to the government. But believe me or not, people believe, you know, people listen to the government's instructions to be in lockdown, not just because people were uh, very uh, willingly and honestly uh, complying, but there were heavy fines involved. You know, if you were found, for example, loitering <laughs> around in a park, then the police would fi fine you maybe $1,200, and it could sometimes go up to several hundred thousand, several thousand dollars. So there was a strict, uh, you know, uh, monetary fine system, which country like India, for example, Bangladesh, uh, cannot impose, you know, because they, it takes time to bring that kind of political culture. Uh, yes. uh, perhaps we need at some point of time, we need to think it very critically and carefully, but that was what made Australia uh, work in terms of responding. Thank you Thank so you. much, Dr. Debit Subedi, uh, for your uh, resourceful deliberation. Uh, I think uh, we are already running out of time. I, and, I uh, know. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. And uh, if I would, I would also want to, I, I will probably be here for another half an hour. I will try to be yeah. more than that. And uh, then yeah. it's already 5.30 here and I have to go out after six. So if I yeah. leave in the meantime, please forgive me. So if people have more questions to put, uh, kindly put in the chat box. And as uh, Dr. D. Subedi has already said that he will give uh, us the email uh, ID. Uh, so you can uh, get your answers there. Uh, so now we move on and uh, over to Atre. This is my email address that comes. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. Now I would request Sri Shujan Sharkar, Assistant Professor, Department of Political Science, Brinalini Dotto Mahavidya Pet Berati, to introduce us to our second speaker of this session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, madam. Good noon, everyone. I am really honored to get such an opportunity to introduce Professor Ganga Thapa, who is our second resource person for today's international webinar. He is a distinguished former professor of political science department at Tribhuvan University, Nepal, where presently he is honorary faculty 
in the department of journalism and mass communication he is also a visiting scholar in the department of international relations university of seoul korea professor thapa is known for his work on conditions of democracy in south asia and he has been part of global democracy research network he has more than four decades of teaching experience we are really grateful to have you with us today sir so without any further delay i would like to request sir please deliver his lecture over to you sir professor thapa i think your your mic is muted still muted do you have professor thapa with us hello professor thapa please unmute yourself please unmute yourself Professor Thapa, please unmute yourself. Professor Thapa, please unmute yourself. Atri, can you guide Professor Thapa to uh, unmute himself? Atri, please guide, please yes, guide sir. Professor Thapa. Actually, I think he is not able to sir, unmute himself. Sir, please tap on your screen. Yes, sir. Sir, please tap on your screen, and you will get to see a red color uh, microphone picture. Just tap on it; it will be unmuted. Prodeep, I think network disruption. Hmm, he is unable to connect. So, uh, Rupa, madam, should we so, proceed with? Uh, oh, Mangal Thapa again joined. Again, Professor Thapa, please unmute yourself. Professor Thapa, please unmute yourself. Tap on the screen and uh, our red uh, signal microphone uh, symbol would be popped up. You just click the uh, symbol, microphone symbol, then you will be get unmuted. Uh, Rupa Madam, Ganga Thapa has already left again. So should we uh, proceed with the uh, next speaker, Professor Arundhati, or uh, we, shall we wait for Ganga Thapa? Uh, 
रूपा मैडम बैक या ही बैक यस ट्राई टू ज्वाइन बट कैन कैन द एडमिनिस्ट्रेटर ऑफ दिस नो सर नो सर ओनली ही कैन अनम्यूट हिमसेल्फ कैन यू या ओके Sir, to unmute yourself, if you are using the upgraded version, see at the bottom of your screen, three options are arriving, appearing. Ah, uh, one is camera option, and other one is a microphone symbol. Just tap on it, you will be unmuted. Hmm. Now there's some problem there. Mm -hmm. can anyone connect professor thapa who had telephone yes he has come again sir professor thapa you you please click on the left most uh, uh, button it is a micro you can see the picture of a micro yes yes now he is yes, thank you welcome sir professor thank thapa you. welcome please proceed thank you. please did you proceed okay okay uh, very sorry for that yes please uh, Uh, yeah, I am. Uh, see me. Hello. You can see me. Yes. So, yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my deep thanks. Uh, uh, first of all, my first of all, my deep thanks to Apurva Kumar uh, Bandopadhyay, Honorable uh, Principal of MD Madhyapit. Ma Ma and uh, dr soma ghosh uh, honorable principal of uh, smm college promen uh, for inviting me to in today uh, i am uh, grateful to you uh, all that you know that uh, uh, you invited a person who is an academic expert i did uh, pursue my in political science uh, not in the hope that i'll be a professor in political science i was a back bencher when i was uh, in the in my three days anyway so i again thank you for you know, everybody uh, for the invitation and uh, i don't think that i'm good to judge you know that uh, that uh, give the you know that uh, how to say that properly is the theme of the seminars it is a very comprehensive at the same time it is very difficult to to explain in a in an hour in uh, two or something like that and the uh, top the topic of the seminars i can divide into three parts uh, you have also talked about the dynamics of democracy second challenges of governance and third is new normal of course that democracy is Talked about is to in political science in several years, not several years and decades in centuries, but many centuries, many 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 uh, hundred many thousand years. We are talking about it, and we are still talking. Maybe we will be talking in the future also. How many years? How many centuries? That I don't know. In many things uh, we have to we have achieved, and many things yet to we have achieved, and it's a never-ending process. democracy you know that it is changing in every year maybe every 10 years 20 years 100 years 50 years that is in ending a process uh, i will uh, you know that uh, try to uh, you know discuss uh, thing three four uh, uh, you know parts at uh, you know that democracy you know that earlier rupa sen already mentioned many things uh, she synthesized uh, many important things and i i pick one 
that is as you are talking about the certain level of social and economic development is required or for political democracy this is you are talking about the you know that my uh, live said and other uh, political scientist i think some of the things were valid uh, some in course of time some of the things are not valid we can take the example of india without having proper uh, level of uh, certain level of economic and uh, social development also in terms of exercising uh, the function of democracy in 70 years so it is not necessary that uh, we must have a uh, minimum level of, uh, level of development, social, economic things uh, to have uh, political democracy. Even uh, rich countries uh, like in Gulf, uh, there are one, uh, almost 24, they don't have democracies. In spite of this, they have very high level of economic development. So some of the indicators may be valid in some countries, maybe some of the uh, uh, indicators may not be valid in some other countries. So let me start by saying that you know, I divided uh, three, four parts I uh, mentioned. When we talk about democracy, we should start from the Plato's time uh, and uh, in Aristotle time, which is called as Athenian democracy. Plato was talking about the uh, government of philosophers and the uh, righteous social order. And similarly, Aristotle was also talking about the, uh, you know, that um, uh, ruler, uh, rule of by the best. Rule by the best, uh, which means that uh, aristocracy, and he also talked about the aristocracy also based on the uh, the, the merit. So these uh, uh, philosophers, Aristotle, uh, Aristotle, Plato, and some other, uh, you know, the contemporary pol uh, political philosophers, they can find uh, their uh, democracy in certain area, certain groups in a certain um, level of people's only. It was not diversified and it was not, you know, you know that uh, they were not talking about the common citizens, limited to some, some, uh, some, some only a small portion of the population. Uh, but they also talked many things about uh, what should be the quality of leader, what should be the qualities of I mean, many things, justice, law, something like that. So anyway, they, these people were talking about that the ruler must be uh, virtuous, and rural must be knowing uh, many things, mathematics, science, uh, many, many things, so that they were focused on the ruler, then people and common citizens. This, that was the Athenian type of uh, Athenian democracy. And um, I uh, moved to, you know, that the, the 17th and 18th century, uh, which was focused on, the, which is called as a democratic uh, revolutions. Uh, at that time, you know that uh, France, uh, UK, and the uh, United States, they were struggling against uh, absolute monarchy, uh, as well as aristocracy. And uh, some of the political philosophers like Hobbes, they are also uh, uh, talking about, uh, he also talking about the absolutist government. And Locke at the same time, you know, they're talking about the, you know, that uh, limited government. And Rousseau also was talking about the general will, or people, which is a pure will, something like that. Anyway, you know, the 17th and 19th century uh, democratic, uh, political activities confined on democratic revolutions, particularly Peace of Westphalia, uh, that is held in, uh, held in uh, 1648. It, you know, that uh, this treaty of Westphalia. Uh, extended uh, uh, to the rest of the world uh, and, uh, you know, that uh, and uh, the multiple system of government or uh, multiple system of ideologies and the independent principles were uh, started uh, since then. So there were a lot of exercise uh, after 17, during 17th and 18th century. In 19th century, you know, that uh, the, the, this is a you know, century of revolution uh, uh, of democracy. Basically, many political philosophers, I don't want to name uh, many of the uh, name of the uh, philosophers, which is a very big list. Basically, uh, J.S. Mill was talking about on liberty and 19th century politics was confined on liberty. In 20th century, you know, that uh, it was the period of it was a century of you know, the popular rule and uh, the notion of uh, democracy uh, by people, uh, for people and uh, uh, you know, by of, of the people. This kind of uh, things was happened and a kind of new political order was, uh, you know, that uh, established. Of course, that we all know that uh, the 19th century, 20th century were dominated by three, four personalities, particularly first half of the uh, 20th century. 
that is by Wood Wilson, this is by Winston Churchill, um, Joseph Stalin, you know, Hitler, you know, they were talking about uh, many things, you know, that the focus was on the military security and they were talking about the democracy, but they were confined at the same time military and they also, you know, you know this kind of things. So, uh, you know, that uh, the, the power of the people, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, in terms of uh, participation, uh, today we are talking about elections, minority rights, and uh, um, these kind of things we are not talking um, by this, uh, this, this, this personalities. So anyway, this kind of, but uh, the uh, rule by people, uh, of the people, uh, of the people was uh, a kind of dominant uh, during this period. So uh, in the 20th century also, you know, that uh, political system was a kind of center-periphery relations, you know, the center guiding to uh, their citizens in the you know that in the regional levels in provincial level at the local levels only the center was so powerful in the people of the countries you know that they have to follow the 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 the, uh, uh, the center orders this kind of no 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 politicians no political scientists uh, you know, no, uh, 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 political leaders were talking about the people's democracy uh, and the, the many few uh, political uh, philosophers were talking about the minority rights and in terms of gender, in terms of um, other, other things, race and everything. So right now we are talking about the democracy uh, in, in terms of uh, people-centered uh, activities. And uh, let me um, briefly tell that uh, more or less the political scientists now uh, agreed on five component of uh, five components. If uh, these five components, if there are these, these five th components, means that you know that the country can be called democracy. I will tell you, the first com component uh, is the election. That must be election. You know that uh, the, the, uh, the the primary component of democracy. There must be election. In the political so system, should be liberal. Uh, election is not sufficient because you know that election also held in authoritarian regimes in military regimes. Even the communist regimes also. Okay, there must be a, the political system must be liberal. First, um, uh, the electoral component. Second, uh, liberal component. Third, participatory. If the if there is election, even there, if there is a uh, liberal political system, if there is no participation um, from the citizen citizen side, if there is no proper mechanism to participate in the uh, decision making process, to participate in the uh, in political activities, means that. The politician cannot have uh, the democratic character. In first, electoral component, second, liberal competent, uh, third, um, participatory competent. Four, it is not sufficient to have a democracy. There must be a deliberative component. The political system should have to deliver to the people. The political system should have to address the concerns, address the demands, address the problems of the common people. So, this political system. If there is a uh, election, also there is a participatory, you know that in, in, in communist system also, there are a high level of uh, political participation by the citizens. But there must be a deliberation. People with the political system should have to deliver to the people. So this is, a th uh, uh, this is the fourth one. And finally, you know that there must be egalitarian component. Means that egalitarian component means that, you know, that every citizen should have to uh, think and uh, every um, citizen, they have to own their political system. There must be a loyalty to their systems, this kind of thing. So if there are these five components, electoral, liberal, uh, uh, participatory, and deliberative, and egalitarian, if these five things are there, then can people be democratic. So you know that just you know that the system of government, Ruled by certain um, uh, constitutions. You know, um, only there are, if there are any uh, executive, judicial, judicial, judiciary, and legislature, is not sufficient. The political should, system should have to uh, should have to be owned by the people. Uh, the, the political system should um, uh, focus on citizens' demands. And uh, earlier, Dr. Subedi was talking about a kind of center state society relation should be. Means maintained here uh, uh, by the political system, you know this kind of the, no hierarchy, and power should be uh, you know that uh, devolved 
that should be you know that uh, you know that delivered to the every household door to door every unit of the lower level this kind of thing so this this is there are these five things even there is a, uh, things are there then we can call democracy uh, country as a democracy uh, country so more or less you know that uh, the country I, I, I right now around 70 percent of the global population are ruled by some sort of democratic systems the these political system are not purely democratic some of them some of them are more democratic this kind there is a variation different variation but roughly 70 percent of the global population is now is ruled by some sort of democratic regimes and still 30 percent of the global population still is ruled by other type of political system maybe they are not democratic some of them they are authoritarian some some of them they are the despotic system so it's still long way to go to achieve the the highest level of democratic exercise in uh, this is the general dynamic so that I, I i was just talking about that you know that the democracy is dynamic it was limited to some um, uh, groups uh, so, some some so, so, some kind of sections in ethnic um, you know the earlier period ancient periods in there was kind of some kind of development in the in the statement in 18th century in 19th century or in 20th century and right now you know that uh, you, the, 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 the notion of uh, to, uh, you know that citizens participation i will just mention that uh, this uh, equality political tolerance accountability transparency regular free and uh, fair elections economic freedom control of uh, the abuse of power separation of power bill of rights a culture of accepting the uh, results of elections human rights multi-party system neutrality of state institution rule of law these are the common these are the things you know that now you know that uh, difficult to establish so sometimes i i confuse that you know that you have uh, chosen the you know, challenges of governance you know some, sometimes i think that you should be uh, the problem is the male governance right now bad governance even you know that uh, the many countries they have the democratic political system they are functioning they are, they are, you know that they are, they are, they are, their governance system is not uh, you know that good and they, they are not properly governed you know that so even the system political system is correct in principle they all have, they have the all mechanisms to, to participate but the, those who are running the souls they are not providing a good governance good governance means that they are the, many of the democratic government they are not transparent they are not accountable they are not you know that um, they, they, you know the responsible in many matters you know that they decide they impose their ideas they impose their decisions they do not listen the people voice these kind of things uh, have to uh, is there and it is long way to achieve this kind of activity so right now the, the, the challenge is you know, you, you know that you, uh, you know that many of the things many of the issues many of the problems of the um, facing by the common people are not now addressing um, by the political system, even developed political system, right? United Kingdom, uh, the, for example, United States also is still there is a social divide. Even in Australia, as Dr. Subhiti was talking, even most of the democratic um, um, countries they are exercising their political uh, system, their political they have a democratic uh, regime for several several hundred years. Also, you know that some of the people, some section of the people, is still are uh, ignored. Their voices are not heard. You know that they are not addressing the people. They only election are there. They have, there is a you know that periodic election, change of government, peacefully. These things are there, but still, the now you know that people are facing many kind of problems. Still, there is a discrimination. You know that legally or even or you know that in practice, this kind of thing. So it is very very difficult. Democracy, many say that it is very hard to win. It is said that uh, difficult to sustain is to lose. M most of the democracy still have in such a um, situation. You know that in Nepal also we have achieved the democracy. We have a society, democratic kind of a democratic society, 19 from 1990. Now 40 years now, it still you know, there are several threats to survive. So in many cases, even I don't know about India, maybe it's still uh, what is the situation? It is functioning a democracy. There is no doubt, but whether it will be. Uh, it is consolidated democracy 
it is difficult to say myself you, you are the best to judge what is um, um, uh, the situation but many developers those who have um, those established after the third wave of democratization they are so fragile and they are not very you know that uh, um, accountable they are not you know that um, supported by the larger portion of the population of course these these new democracies are elected I mean, there is an election they are you know the elected by the people formed by based on the election but still these democracies also are facing several even you know that even I, i also see that problems are everywhere even the established democracy like uk united states also they are facing uh, the uh, situation so it is very very difficult to establish the governance systems i i just mentioned earlier how to um, achieve the political equality how to achieve the economic equality how to maintain the political freedom how to distribute the resources how to how to redistribute the economic benefits to all levels of population because you know that so this is a very very um, very challenging area very very challenging still to 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 the countries who have and um, the exercising democracy several years third wave and third wave democracy basically they are they are centrally located there is no proper means of communication no transportation no health systems because you know that many of the new democracy are suffering from the social reform there are no social reform political reform is there there is also liberalization means that you know that they are accepting privatization they are making other kind of things through the liberalization process there is a globalization many of the countries they are accepting but you know that there is no social reforms like you know that dr subedi also were talking the other people also are talking about this pandemic you know that this pandemic it exposed the world it stopped the world it also exposed the world even developed world even united states even united kingdom it seems that they are not capable to tackle the pandemic and many of the things are still fragile positions like in india in nepal also we are also in the high of facing this kind of pandemic problems and we have very limited resources because you know that in nepal you know, the, the health sector is purely private you know that if you have the money you can go to, the, to see the doctors maybe in india also you know that you can if you have the money you can see the doctors there is no health reforms given no universal health care systems no 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 universal education system no you, you, it, social reforms are still very lacking in most of the democracy without social reforms you know that it is very difficult to survive in my point of view you know that a kind of um, ca- ca- casino capitalism we are adapting this liberalizing globalization casino capitalism in a survival of the fittest few rich people will survive i think this kind of um, system may not working Uh, for long time there must be a kind of you know that sustainable welfare uh, system we have to edit so so that this is a beginning but uh, it took a long time to achieve these things but it is not you know sure that that uh, the, the things will establish and uh, country will develop so is social reform is lacking in most of the countries in most of the democracies we don't have the, this kind of system because if the person is rich only they can go to the better school better college and they have better education and there is some uh, large number of people are poor they cannot afford a proper education they cannot receive to the good doctors and hospitals you know that there is only a class at the same time there is also a class you know that emerging two three type of class um, rich class uh, middle class and it is dividing in the social there is a division of class maybe you know that This, this kind of things you know that are not happening uh, class you know that it will create a lot of problems in the future uh, you know that um, so this is uh, the right time you know, this covid new normal you are talking about this is the right time to opportunity um, for the um, governments um, uh, around the world to change their mentality their change their uh, social system their change their economic system the change their education system so we should work uh, in a way that you know that how how we can address the demands of the um, people we, how we can address the even a common um, address the demands of common people so we should not have to uh, create the you know that hierarchy you know let us give the power uh, let, let us give the power to the people 
let us have a more more in, you know that political use at the local level this should not be interfered by the central government there must be a kind of uh, let us create an independent autonomous local institution so that they can look after their uh, population their voters their electorate so that they, they directly you know, you know that you know that uh, you know that uh, 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 clear the, uh, the problems of the local population you know that still many of the democracies are you know that centrally powerful they are there even in india you know that it is a, I, I, I see that it is a kind of semi federal system still the center is very powerful it dominates or it creates you know that supervise this kind of thing. so let us you know that we have to have a fundamental change and it's a long way to it is not a you know that can happen in uh, 10 20 years and 30 years but this pandemic also you know that provides providing us a, a kind of opportunity a kind of challenge this kind of things are there so <clears throat> My point is that you know that the main problem is still you know that that the governance system. You that, that you know that uh, you, you, I used to uh, um, I prefer to say that better governance. If there is a better governance, there is a better economic growth. I do not talk about this good governance. You know, good governance, but better governance. I prefer to say. So basically, you know that democracy only gaining the you know that political rights. Uh, you know that are not sufficient. It's still economic and social rights. It's still not, you know, that sufficiently, you know, that, um, you know, that, um, uh, how, how to say that, sufficiently, uh, you, you know, that um, uh, uh, addressed by the uh, political system and the government. So we shall have to focus on social rights. Basically, let us have to give the opportunity to the people for employment, better education, and a better health. In, in a better kind of sanitation, better environment. So it is, you know, that not easy task, but it is not impossible because you know that it, in politics it is impossible. It is possible, and the political leaders are the, you know, that uh, the, uh, are, you know, they can, they should be, they should realize uh, the properly the 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 the, 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 the problems of the the, the electorate. And uh, in terms of not only winning the elections, in uh, many of the political system, uh, political parties in third world democracies, they make a lot of permissions. And they win elections. After, they, after the elections, um, you know, they, they forget many of their permissions. This is the problem. This is the problem uh, everywhere. This is a common problem. And corruption. Corruption is damaging and every uh, part of our society. Corruption is everywhere. In my country, in Nepal, corruption is rampant. Everywhere, you know that you know, they are making money. A lot of politicians they make money, bureaucrats they make money, even you know the security uh, people also they make money. This kind of corruption, how to control the corruption? Talking about the challenge of governance, means that there is also you know that uh, how to overcome the corruption. This is the main problem in the rule of law. Rule of law means that rule is there, there. There are many rules, but there is no rule of law because the poor people they can be punished, but the rich people they are not punishing. Because they can have different kind of, you know, that influences, the kind of, they, they, they can have different, uh, some connection with the big people, and they can easily, you know, that uh, go, they, 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 they are not punishing, this kind of things. Corruption, it is not, it, um, the rule is there, there is no rule of law. And that the people, you know, that a lot of people, there is a, you know, that they are not in a position to properly participate. Because of their lack of education, <clears throat> lack of you know that other kind of uh, activities, uh, lack of any, any kind of uh, training, they are not capable. They are not independent. They are they are they are they are they are, they are, they are, they are not relying only their you know traditional type of agriculture, training type activities. They are, they are, you know that uh, lot of people they are there is unemployment. I don't know uh, even India, Pakistan, in South Asia, I mean, the third world country, but a higher number of population, you know, that people, even they are educated, very difficult to get jobs. If they get jobs also, you know, that they have to, you know, that bribe the, you know, that the authorities to get it in this kind of things. Also, one of the other things, you know, that a lot of the you know, third world countries, um, government, everything is politicized. Those who are in power, they you know that control everything. 
they control economy they control politics they control education they you know enroll their own person you know you know the in terms of you know that how to say that you know western political science they say that it kind of political politics is there so that connections you know if there is a connection you will get better results even you are not less educated or, or under educated you are, if you are not on a, not competitive because you know, this kind of thing so so the, the, the thing is that you know that system are there system is not bad uh, we are also adopting a kind of federal government it is more advanced level of federal government nepal is adopting you know that we have more um, first past the post system and proportional systems also that we also have 33 percent women reservation in our parliament in every ward level also represented by two women one is the also by the one woman there should be in every ward you know that the, the you know that so called um, you know dalit groups every year in system you know there is a perfect system which is more ermas than british or on the other kind of uh, systems and there is also participation in the women but the still you know that the running the show the politics is running by some people some vested interest people and they are you know that these people even in india in the parliament they are in the provincial government they are in the local government their voices is still not heard this is the problem you know that so half of the you know that uh, population is women there is still discrimination there they are not properly getting you know given the proper places you know that and in everywhere i think this is the common com- com- common problem in, in, in most of the developed country so of course uh, you know that the india is you know the in south asia the longest and you know that uh, the biggest democracy uh, you know that it is uh, working uh, since 70 years uh, to some extent uh, you know that function uh, that i just uh, told that uh, we are taking some lessons from india uh, from from, from uh, we in nepal also the nepali government also taking this kind of thing but many things to, to do because you know that it is not something i mean that you know, what i want to say that i you 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 to say that in india i think around 40% of the indian population are below the poverty line it is not it is not i am saying it is the old bank and other i am for the, the indicators if the 70 years of democracy in 40 years 40% of the indian population are below the poverty line means whether poverty or democracy is working uh, on behalf of the poor people or not this is a question we have to rethink our leaders they have to rethink that well, what is wrong when wrong during the 70 years of democracy quite went wrong people are becoming more poor more you know that uh, 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 unemployed un- un- unemployed so, so this kind of thing uh, in nepal also you know that now, right now a lot of education uh, educated people are there and you know, still uh, many of them i don't know i, I have no I, uh, data but uh, the, the un- unemployment rate is very high in most of the people even they are higher education they are going to korea and japan to work for manual work even you know some of the younger young people who have been educated master degree under undergraduate or graduate degree they are in the gulf countries about roughly you know 6 million in, in nepali youth are working uh, outside you know just for the, in the labor work they are, they don't have the proper work. this kind of things i also was reading one 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 uh, report that in india in last 5 years maybe more than uh, 70 lakhs of, uh, roughly they went outside to have a better education only few hundred thousand people they came in india to have a, uh, uh, foreign students are in india so what is happening why people are going out if the people from india goes to canada if the people go indian people goes to america like my country also if the people go to canada in australia in the um uh, in united states they do not want to come back because they think that they are not secure if they come back to they want to retain their living there they want to uh, many many of the people uh, you know that they want to have uh, work how to get the green card or pr uh, pc some uh, this kind of thing so why this is this this type of thing because you know that <clears throat> here the uh, everything is happening in terms of money and uh, you know that only the few people so there, there is a class you know that certain people um, certain 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 sector of the people uh, are running you know that the politics yeah, i am looking at the nepal politics since 30 years and same type of people uh, they are in the in, in, in the government in 30 years time no no new people sometimes congress is running the same person are there minister sometimes commissioner ruling 
and they, they are the same people are uh, 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 their people those who were in the 1991 1992 so we, you know the some only the you know that the some certain section of people they are they are dominating politics they are dominating you know that the universities you know that uh, they, they, we are not welcoming the new generation of people new educated people so that the old mindset is still there we, the uh, government uh, our government should have to change uh, their its mindset they, because you know that unless they are the, 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 the government change its mindset and these people are you know that more enlightened and uh, it is very difficult to change the uh, things you know especially challenging uh, the challenge of government that you know that i already talked about you know, that there must be some kind of system it should be based on merit your system it must be uh, based on their experiences it, these are the things you know that right as aristotle um, talking about the uh, rule by the uh, best that is you know that so it is very very you know that uh, challenging task uh, in terms of uh, you know that governance is still we nepal many countries uh, let me repeat that um, uh, suffering from the bad governance uh, is a long way to go to have accountable political system and uh, the uh, system in uh, this covid you know that i do not know much about it you know that uh, i am if uh, dr fauci uh, is correct you know that uh, who, who used to fauci mean that the american cdc chief that he was talking about that uh, it will be you know that uh, there will be more than 70 percent who will be infected uh, by this covid uh, in the united states you are talking about it is not going to end uh, very soon and uh, the, the the so called uh, vaccine uh, uh, things you know that it is very difficult to get it and uh, by countries like ours and uh, because you know that uh, we still are poor maybe some of the people they can afford maybe the government can afford but we should, the reality is that you know that we have to work with the covid and this kind of uh, this kind of virus you know the virus and our our everybody was to go side by side simultaneously and um, um, there, there is uh, there, there, it is not going to end but you know that um, certainly you know that my point is that it is because of the lack of uh, political obligations uh, i mean that uh, the, by the rulers you know that people are suffering and i do not blame to one person or two person in the, the, the it is not a question but uh, the, you know that the governance challenge is not only in the third world or developing or aspiring democracy it is everywhere in the world and uh, you know that i also surprised that uh, many of the world there is a kind of a new nationalism uh, now you know that uh, in the last few years in new nationalism in the name of you know nationalism you know that some of the uh, political parties some of the leaders they are capturing uh, a kind of you know they are giving a kind of popular slogan and the populist uh, regimes are there still uh, in many countries i do not want to name but in still in united states in united kingdom in australia austria and there are many other including india also you know that they give a kind of in, 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 sir uh, dr thapa yes. yes. hello dr yes. thapa uh, could you wind up yeah. Mane, we are already running yeah, yeah. yeah. I, late one minute huh. so that um, so that it is very challenging task and they you know that uh, let uh, me conclude that democracy is dynamic it will be dynamic uh, in the days to come and the challenge of governance cannot be overcome in a year two and month and year it will take but we should have uh, this should be started right now in this covid it is not behind it is not a uh, capacity and control by by one means or maybe one government it is a collective there must be a collective effort to overcome this uh, covid and uh, there must be a social reform in every political system only this uh, there is a social reform in the political system uh, you know that we could not achieve why we, we intended to uh, uh, achieve thank you very much for your kind uh, your invitations and uh, for the opportunity thank you very much thank you Thank you, Professor Thapa, for your uh, insightful and thought-provoking lecture. You have thrown a light on how the democracies take place and how it changes from time to time, and how now the democracy. 
Yes, Monidipa. You're not audible, Monidipa. You're not audible. Five components where the democratic the democracy. Hello, 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 hello. You're audible. Yes, now you. Okay, okay. Thank you, Professor Thapa, for your enlightenment and thought-provoking lecture. You have thrown a light upon the changes of the democracy, how the components are needed for a good uh, a democracy, and how it should work. I am uh, seeing some question for you, sir. Yes, shall sir. I? Shall I uh, um, read Monidipa, for you? Could we, Monidipa, could we no. just uh, skip the Q and A session so okay. that we could actually manage the time? At the end. Okay, hmm. okay, 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 sir. Now I would request uh, our third speaker and uh, have an opportunity to introduce our third speaker, Dr. Arundhati Chakraborty, and share with you, you a few words about her. Dr. Arundhati Chakraborty is the Vice Principal and IQAC Coordinator of KC College of Engineering of Management Studies and Research, Thane, Maharashtra. Dr. Chakraborty has done her PhD in Ceramic Engineering from NIT, Center of Excellence, Raoul Kela, in 2011. She has acted as the principal investigator of a DST-sponsored research project under Women Scientist Scheme and a principal investigator and coordinator of an interdisciplinary project in association with CIDCO. She has also authored several books at international level and scholarly articles in reputed international journals. She is the certified ISO auditor for 9001, certified trainer from ILTC and Missouri State University and a reviewer for Silver Publications, Journal of Alloys and Compounds. I am truly honored to you to have you, uh, ma'am, with us today. I would now request you to please deliver your lecture. Thank you. Over to you, ma'am. Hello. Good afternoon to all of you. Am I audible? Yes, yes. ma'am. You are audible. Thank you. So uh, it was really nice uh, to hear from all the speakers, Dr. D.B. Suvaddi, Professor Ganga Thapa. Uh, because basically, as the introduction was there, I am from physics background. So I am not much aware of the various dynamics of uh, democracy and governance. So taking uh, this a bit will be my presentation will be a bit of beat of my talk it will be a little bit another direction rather i'll be means what i'll be trying is i'll be sharing my experiences during this few uh, months of pandemic what we faced and how the challenges actually we handled it so so before starting i wish uh, as durga puja is going on it has almost started so i wish you all a very happy durga puja Today is uh, the fourth day of uh, Navratri. So today is Chaturthi. And on this day of Chaturthi, we actually commemorate uh, Goddess Kushmanda. So the Goddess Kushmanda, if I elaborate it a bit, Ku means uh, little, Ushma means the energy and warmth, and Anda means the cosmic egg. So if we combine all this, it means the little cosmic egg. And that is actually the universe. Okay, and uh, the goddess Kushmanda, she is the only smiling goddess in this nine avatars of uh, Mata. And she is the goddess who resides in the core of the sun. And from there, she controls the entire universe. That's what the folklore story is about. And she is the goddess of vegetation. And uh, she looks after all the nature and well-being. So today, you know, for nine days, different nine colors are followed. And today, the color of Navratri today is the day green. And what has happened is, I had not seen this earlier, but coincidentally, the color of the presentation of the small PPT which I prepared that has also turned out to be green over here. So starting with it, I require your just permission. Shall I share the screen over here? Sure. Sure, do it. Thank, thank you. Yes. I hope the screen is visible here i hope it is visible the screen yes visible yeah 
Thank this you. Hmm. Yeah. So here you can see the topic of my title, what I've chosen over here is e-gurukul. Because being in this field of education, we have taken everything online over here. So this is what is e-gurukul over here. And you know, when we are uh, dealing with uh, various uh, presentations and all, when we are in this online mode, uh, the method of interaction, that is what one of the most important thing. So in this COVID period, the and uh, which I talked about, you know, the Kushmanda, the goddess Kushmanda, what does mean with the energy and warmth? So that energy and warmth is required in all of us to carry us through this period of pandemic, to foresee this period and to cross this period and come out of it in a victorious manner. So here I'd like to just have a small interaction with you all. So. I'll just request you all, can you please, uh, let's interact a bit, a bit more interactive here. So I request you all, can you please open your uh, browser and uh, on a side-by-side -side browser and can you all please go to www.menti.com. Hello, can I, can I have you, can we have this in, trying to have it? Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So please, uh, I request all the audience or the participants over here, jo, those who are listening to this, I request you all. So let's have this. Let's understand. Can we have this? Can you all open the browser of www.menti.com? And uh, when you open this www.menti.com and it is screen, you'll be seeing a text box coming up and codes written over there, one, two, three, four, five, six. So can you please enter the code 5674066 as you can see on the screen over here. You just need to open in a separate browser, menti.com, M-E-N-T-I dot com and you can type uh, any word that came to your mind when you heard about first heard about the word lockdown 1.0 so everything is in lockdown mode so what did you feel what did you experience at that time so, uh, you can enter any three to four words which comes to your mind you can just enter and press the button as submit so when you do that you can see my screen over here and also you all can see on your screen what even the others are typing so it a word web uh, or word web will be coming up on the screen over here so i'm trying here something so i request you all if you can please come ahead with this Hello. Yes, can anyone please confirm whether we can carry on with this or whether should I got back to the presentation? No, you carry on. I think, madam, uh, you it is better if you uh, go on showing it on the screen. Uh, I, yeah. I don't know, I'm afraid how many are actually um, trying for the browser and all that. If you uh, okay. yourself show, it's better. We will know okay. it. Okay, ma'am. Ma'am, I have typed a few words if you could see. Yes, them. yes, I can also see. I think you all can also see. How is yes. this disruption of normalcy, online class, restricted? So I can see some words coming up now. Shut down, closed, restricted. So, so this is what, you know, a, a method of interaction with the students, with the teachers. Whenever we are there, we can also understand or get to know each other to some extent. So I can see here three of the people have participated here also. That also you can see on your screen where the screen I have shared. Bandh, me, we. Yes, so everything was in a like a state of confusion. We are under house arrest, right? So how do we communicate with each other? What, what will happen? So that uncertainty and all those uh, different, different notes and different different ideas are we what is going to happen are we going to contradict this COVID and all those questions webinars okay webinar also came to my mind nice family time yes that's a quite we 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 could uh, spend time together yes 
so concentrate on my singing so some people could follow their own hobbies also concentrate on studies that's quite nice okay we have got here a mixture of some positive as well as some kya hoga that anxious feeling is also over here right so after this now my we can keep on doing this now the next question right let's move on to the next question did you learn something new in this new normal what a request is again please you can refer to this browser of uh, wherever you are entering www.menti.com or you can close the browser where you were typing it again and you can open a new browser and in that please type again www.menti.com and you can use the code over there 8483666 Eight four eight three triple six, and you can when you open it now. So my qu the question over here is: Did you learn something new in this new normal? So one poll is already there, and it's a yes. So two polls are yes. Let's see how many more polls we can get in another. I'll just wait for another one minute and proceed further. So this is actually, uh, you know. Uh, So, so even if five people have said yes, it's it's uh, it's not uh, no one is pressing. I think that no one. So it's a hundred percent yes. I'm getting. Otherwise, I would have got a pie chart saying five percent maybe yes, rest ninety five percent maybe no. But it's not that. It's that yes. So all of us have learned something new in this new normal or in this previous few months of pandemic. It can. It could have been related to the field, or it may have been out of the field or some area of your personal interest. we would have we have learned something new okay so that's really nice so it was really good to have that participation and all thank you for your answers so i'll move forward with the presentation again i'll just hide it okay so this is the question which we already took so we saw some uh, difficulties arising and learning something new so i being from a physics background what else can i quote that other than that of albert einstein so his quote is in the middle of difficulty lies opportunities so life will be throwing difficulties at us and we as human being should be able to identify those and convert those into our opportunity so talking about opportunities taking us forward so i told earlier that uh, being from a physics background i'll be taking into that direction only and but uh, being a vice principal and iqc coordinator of a private college the college where i am working is a private engineering college with a professional degree course and it is affiliate to the university of mumbai so uh, it's it cannot follow its own curriculum we are bound to the curriculum which is defined by the university so uh, with those restrictions at place what we did in this few months so the opportunities with respect to education what all we faced and how we incorporated the changes how did the world open up for us how did this pandemic has affected the environment the environment surrounding us nature because that's one of the most important aspect of our life and without people and because let it be any industry if you are not having because that makes the core you know that makes the core of our uh, life where we are working of our home anywhere so moving forward education now we as being as teachers or we as human beings are very resist much resistance to change we don't want to change so being in this field of education we like to go in a very conventional manner i would if something has to be changed no that is not good some of the other excuses that's the you know essence of our mind because you know whenever we are going we there are two types of energy everyone knows it positive energy and negative energy when we are going towards a negative energy you know it's a downfall it's towards a down direction you know always it's very easy to slip down a uh, means a slope than to rather to climb it up 
so that's what the thing is so we are resistant to change but this pandemic forced us all of us forced all of us into having this change is forced us into having our teaching materials all those things online in a content in a digitized mode so digitization of all the contents is an important thing now with the digitization what happened here 24 by 7 they could access it at any point of time for example this webinar we are in here this international webinar now some of the teach some of them could attend some of them could not attend now this session as i can see it is being recorded so it will be hosted maybe on the college website so this Uh, will be access those who want to view it they can even view it later and learn things from it and they can upgrade their skills so this is what this is your one of the form of your blended mode of learning over here so all this content so that is what this trios even you know just one uh, thing i'll again share with you when this lockdown period started in the month of march we never imagined that it would drag us so long till we are in the at the fag end of october and still we have not started with our online lectures and uh, means, uh, sorry offline lectures and practicals so but in the month of march itself we envision that something this sort of difficult situation we may creep in and by the end of march by 25th of march we had started with our online lectures and not only the online lectures to some extent not to 100 percent but to some extent with our practicals also because in a professional degree course without practicals we are not move, moving further much right so all this contents were online we learned the google classroom we so we uh, learn how to take lectures through google meet and even another experience i'd share ki how to record the video lectures online because we used to uh, view video lectures but we never recorded except one or two teachers all of us suppose we have got a 100 teachers at our college we did not have ki all the 100 teachers are having their contents online it never happened so so what we did was so students the students came up ma'am we know this Uh, we know the software. Can we teach it? Well, fine. So we had some sessions arranged by the students, and it was really a new experience where the students were teaching the teachers on some softwares. Also, I would name it like Filmora was there, Bandicam is there, OBS Studio is there. So they were teaching us with so enthusiasm. So there was a complete turnover of things, and that was a very good feeling where we could see. Okay, so we are also learning something very new and upcoming over here because you know. our olden methods are or ancient period of teaching how was it it was your gurukul method of teaching now in this gurukul method of teaching what it used to happen was there was a method of oral uh, teaching verbal teaching and also there was a method of your critical thinking okay chintan method was there but somewhere in this teaching period whatever we were doing earlier what had happened is because of uh, this continuous ki syllabus we have to complete on time this exam has to be there this process is there so with all those we were like we were just running after something but this period of whichever we got to realize ourselves in that period we realized no that the critical thinking part that is supposed to be done by the students was got got missing somewhere so this online mode of teaching also so gives us an opportunity for example what i started myself was some of the videos i used to uh, means for uh, for example i'll be teaching some topic for example on uh, let it be simple quantum mechanics for example i'm just reading so i felt that those students who are just who will be coming and learning this thing should know this content prior to it but because of my time limitation in the on offline mode in the during the lectures i won't be able to do it so what i did was i record did those video lectures i posted it on the google classroom and followed by it some quiz and some critical thinking questions was also there so that were posted over there the students could think about it could go about it and that is also one of the factors what the outcome based education what this various accreditation bodies like nda nac nba is a accreditation body which is compulsory for the professional institutes like engineering management and all and nac being a degree college you are aware of that so all these are a part of it of the outcome based education because that's what they are talking about ki whatever you are doing is not like you are you are going to the class and you are delivering the things you don't know whether the uh, whether the 
knowledge or whether the information has been received at the other end or not but this outcome based education it is a method it will uh, it forces us to believe that the other person the other should be able to connect with it should be able to know about it because there's a various blooms level and all those details are there i won't be going into much there now coming back to the skills now this nep the national education policy which is coming up uh it's talking about interdisciplinary approach but now it's all where we are in this situation by various certification bodies whatever bodies are there we can just go into the courses which we like which we feel like which we feel like we have got interest in and we can learn them out so in this pandemic the uh, the online uh, education sources like coursera udemy coursera mainly they approached our institute and we had those free courses run those three courses are from all over the uh, world from stanford there are from mit there are from harvard some all courses are there on uh, arts they are there on the science on engineering courses even the courses on covid was also there mental health management everything was there so we were able to pursue those courses you know and even it helped us and we even uh, uh, means uh, what we did we even uh, motivated our uh, non teaching staff to pursue those two a uh, great their skills even in terms of the computer proficiency depending upon the fields which they are in which we felt that as an institute they should be trained to so their skills also got upgraded to that extent so what i'm trying to say is that this lockdown period or this um, confinement did not stop us from learning new things from exploring new ideas or from getting into one zone only or just being confined into some other place so uh further moving forward in continuation to it, so the world is now open it's a completely open world now so it has just shrunken okay it has just shrunken into the palm of our hands with a mobile phone or a laptop and an internet connectivity and that's what we are doing today we are in an international webinar okay we are in an international webinar where there are speakers from nepal from australia from us and we are able to share whatever we are Uh, whatever we know uh, from our fields of working so and its accessibility also and the most effective part from governance point of view that's the cost efficiency because whenever we used to organize like workshops earlier seminars earlier and um, uh, the fdps the faculty development program these things on here always a cost factor used to play a major role over there and also the time factor because the speaker also or the invitee also delegates they had to flew from other places to the place where it was being conducted so all those just shrunk so we can have this knowledge sharing basis in an open like at the introduction at the start dr rupa singh said that so yes it's just at the tip of the iceberg we are in we have just started to and we hope that this trend continues and there is no limitations at our uh, being uh, uh, means uh, sharing with each other letting know each other and also have the social connect to some extent with each other and with this knowledge sharing here another thing we'd like to say before this lockdown our uh, you know our college fest that the technical fest and uh, the um, the technical festival and the cultural festival that was supposed to be held in the month of april everything was planned everything was good to go and suddenly this lockdown came and everything came to a halt but our student council members they even took the pain they said that no we will be conducting it online and and our vision was that yes we wanted our students to be engaged we did not want the whatever the negativity whatever was going around in the world to be they should shouldn't be have been affected by it so we so we converted all those programs and we took that entire five days the event in an online mode and that was completely done in an online mode with various games events their uh, talent um, uh, shows and everything it was done in an online mode only over there so a uh, challenge is actually to eradicate the old mindset and embrace new solutions over there now moving on to the next one the ecology and the environment the covid the coronavirus all these there were uh, many theories underlying it there are many theories underlying it it, uh, it was uh, manufactured in a lab of wuhan or it's a nature mutation we don't know but somewhere the nature got affected by it a lot 
we saw during this period the nature our during our confinement nature heal itself we saw the water of the river ganges turn back to its normal we started breathing a cleaner air so how was it so because of the various pollutions the global warming all those subsided a bit more so if we can further go into this waste management and reduce our carbon footprint that will be very very good what is your carbon because that's also our role as a being a part of in the administrative part or in the governance part that this is very very important to make our surrounding peers um aware of this situation what's a carbon footprint it's actually you know the harmful gases or the greenhouse gases which are emitted during an human during a human activity i'll just give you an example suppose i want to get some errand for my house i want to do some errand and that shop is lies around 4 km so either i'll be taking my two wheeler or either i will be taking my four wheeler and i'll drive down there so when i'm driving down i'm burning the fossil fuel over there when i reach the uh, shop over there so there it's being run on electricity there it is uh, emitting some gases the, the people over there who are working over there they must have driven down to the place the fruits and the vegetables they must have been transported the the place the farm where they have been grown they must have um, exhale ethane uh, methane over there so it is much more harmful we have carbon dioxide so all those acts to your one complete human activity you know one activity whatever we are doing over there so that should be reduced so even you know the wires which we throw uh, the batteries which we throw it shouldn't go in the dustbin but rather it should go for the waste management part even in our colleges and that what we keep on doing for the various waste waste management practices of our college also on the world environment day we donate those to the ngo whom with we have a mou and they give it to the recycling plant plant when they are when they get recycled and all now in this accreditation process this is this is another challenge because the papers in the various accreditation process whatever we use 1 kg of paper you know it takes around 300 to 400 liters of water to prepare 1 kg of paper and that's huge and the most efficient plant which is in north america it takes around 10 to 25 liters of water to prepare 1 kg or to manufacture 1 kg of paper so our challenge was here he sitting at home now now we are not running the college in an online mode even all of the people we cannot go and go with this process uh, with the various accreditation process paperwork because acr has to be submitted and other nba is going on nirf is there. so lot many aict dt ugc lot many bodies is bodies are there so how do we do it so our challenge was so we took it as a challenge and we took the entire process of maintaining this documentation in an online mode and we have done it and we have prepared the acc which is the annual report as you all are aware to submit it in an online mode only all the documentations all the proofs they have been prepared and they are being maintained in an efficient manner to have it to carry it forward in an online mode over there there is a question of authentication because you know there is a very clear example priorly we when we used to take photos photos ke fir we used to take those albums and we has to keep the albums and keep it printed over there because ek for real me 36 photos ek kitne aate the earlier when we used to have those uh, normal uh, photo uh, cameras and all but now what do we do we have those all in e mode all or either we keep them in folders or either we keep them in mobile and whenever we feel like looking at we just surf through it or we have those in our on our facebook or our social media accounts so that is what it is so if those things can be online then why do we waste the paper here also why can't we take these things online as well so we take all these and take it as a challenge and prepare it get it in the online mode and we have been able to do it successfully over there now as i told earlier the uh, an industry an institute a place is nothing without the people and during this turbulent times the mental health of the people the physical health of the people was the most important one with the eq and iq balance and with the various hr practices and the norms of it so empathy we had also some cases in our college you know where people suffered from this they contracted this deadly virus so that support was there that 
uh, that uh, support from the governance it was always there it was uh, we used to give them support whatever because being a private institute con continuous deliverable deliverables are required so somewhere down the line it was uh, empathetically handled and it was not sympathy but it's rather empathy where you have a two way communication you don't have to be in that situation but you understand the feelings of the people over there and like was again i will again quote back to dr rupa sen what she rightly said was at the start he there were there is a complete uh, you know uh, turnover and where there are many interactions between the governing body and the staff those who are working and that's what is one of the most important thing continuous interactions to check with their mental health and their physical health also and with some of the good hr practices so and for this health part at the start itself in the month of april we as a institute started with regular yoga sessions online we used to switch and the first session i still remember what we had one was we had a doctor on board with us and she shared some of the tips some of the method where you can keep yourself healthy and also your family members healthy how to maintain the things which are getting from outside how to keep them hygienic because that was also a matter of concern everyone was afraid everything is like lagta tha ki everything is has got a corona virus attached to it so with those things we tried and practice it and here uh, one thing with respect to hr practices is reminds me i just get uh, tell that with respect to placement students now they had a fear those who were passing out he okay now this placement is going to take a big hit and what about internships also but no this internships was also taken online internships mm -hmm. even in the college we had some um, uh, online internship practices also we took the students on board some students went for online internships outside where we contacted with the college uh, other uh, industries and all and also for the various placement now also placement from uh, lti was there um, infosys was there so all this placement scenarios now they are going in an online mode what is done is simple things like this google meet where there so different google meet platforms are created and in this various google meets uh, people are uh, means uh, different rooms are created like one is the hr room then you will be having a technical round so various round in this manner one person goes from the one round to the other and it moves forward so everything is possible now so hopefully Uh, in the upcoming in the near future also we will be retaining some of the practices so that we are able, some of the good practices will be returning it retaining it and moving forward when the things are turning back to the returning back to the normal or to the new normal because with this new practices set in so with respect to that i conclude thank you Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for your illuminating speech. We all were indeed captivated by your thought-provoking exposition. I would now request our honourable principal, madam of Hiralal Majumdar Memorial College for Women, Dr. Shoma Ghosh, madam, for delivering the valedictory address. Over to you, ma'am. uh thank you and uh, i'm really indebted to all the speakers who have delivered such illuminating speech and from these illuminating lectures one thing has become clear that is there is a baseline agreement that governance refers to the style of governing in which actually a uh, boundaries between and within public and private sectors have become almost obsolete the roles that were expected to be played by govern governments till 1980s have been mostly taken away by the private sectors and which has created another sort of challenges in this new normal the main point is that political institutions no longer exercise a monopoly of orchestration of governance uh as john peer observed in 2000 in his book debating governance 
the concept of governance indicates a shift away from well established notions of the way government sought to re uh, resolve societal problems through top down approach it has become clear from all these speeches by our esteemed resource persons that a new tone for power dependence among different actors on different fields from health to education uh has already been set a new network of relationship between the actors that is the state market and civil society has emerged to provide the public good as demanded by the uh, by a country's uh, citizens in an effective transparent impartial and accountable manner in this emerging wave of relationships it shouldn't be believed that state is ineffective state is the source of laws and democracy legitimates this them as a democratic state is based on rule of law and its delicacy is dependent on its capacity to act on this basis the coordination and coherence among a wild disparate array of actors can only be brought about by state and its institutions uh we have learned that governance and democracy with its extensive participative institutions has to depend on democratic functioning of government itself for legitimacy participative institutions need to help the state to enforce laws effectively and transparently this is what the democracy is doing in new normal to make a shift from government to governance which was already in the process since 1980s with this tune of our discussions already set in the morning session we are going to uh, be enlightened in the evening session regarding this new role of the state in a democratic setup which is not about uh, creating new institutional setup but also about refurbishing old ones we may learn in the evening session how civil society accepts democracy not only as an agent for polls every 5 years but as a facilitator for being vigilant for monitoring institutional performance and holding them accountable throughout these years with that brief observation made on the basis of such resourceful lectures you would like to take break for lunch but before that it is the time to convey our thanks to all the honorable resource persons professor subedi professor thapa and professor arundhuti chakraborty i would like to convey my thanks to all the organizers and participants and not the least our technical coordinators our two junior faculty members ms atri vacharya and pooja das and with that i must express my enormous gratitude to the principal of mrinalini dotto mahavidyapeet and head and teachers of both mrinalini dotto mahavidyapeet and hiralal mazumdar memorial college for women as well i express my thanks to ipsc coordinators of both the colleges and other members of iqac of both mahamin maha mrinalini dotto mahavidyapeet and hiralal mazumdar memorial college for women for taking the initiative 
for a webinar on such a brilliant topic of discussion with my enormous sense of gratitude to all the speakers and to the principal professor dr apurbo kumar bandobadhyay of mohammed uh, mohanalini dr mohabiddapit i'd like to hand it over for formal vote of thanks thank you thank you madam with this thank we come you. to the end of the morning session it's time for the formal vote of thanks i would now request sri jayanta debnath assistant professor department of political science mrin nalini dr mahavidyapet berati to render the vote of thanks over to you sir thank you madam ladies and gentlemen a very good afternoon to all i deem it great honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this occasion on behalf of the webinar organizing committee i would like to thank the departments of political science of minalini dr mohabiddapit birati and hiralal mojumdar memorial college for women dakshineshwar for coming together to organize this international webinar jointly i convey my profound regards and hearty thanks to our distinguished experts of the first session Dr. D. B. Subedi, University of New England, Australia; Professor Ganga Thapa, Tibun University, Nepal; and Dr. Arundhati Chakraborty, K. C. College for Engineering and Management Studies and Research, Maharashtra. I thank all the honourable delegates who blessed us with their presence. I further take the opportunity to thank Simuti Chandima Bhattacharya, President of the Governing Body, Minalini Dr. Mahavidyapit, for her continuous guidance and support. to the overall development of the college i also thank our honorable principal dr apurbo kumar bandopadhyay for his continuous support and encouragement to arrange such programs and his kind presence i thank dr soma ghosh principal hiralal mojumdar memorial college for women for her advice and guidance and also for an excellent valedictory speech i extend thanks to the iqc coordinator dr rupa sen of hiralal mojumdar memorial college for women for our efforts towards the event i would also like to thank convenors of the webinar professor pradeep mukherjee and dr rina gosmitra for their exceptional efforts to organize such a wonderful event i thank professor pooja das and professor atri bhattacharya for technical support we are also indebted to professor putip chatterjee department of political science the university of kolani for its cooperation to organize the event a special thanks to the teachers students and staff of both colleges for joining the webinar thank you all again for making this session fruitful uh, at the end i would uh, like to take this opportunity to convey our gratitude to our governing body president mr madhun mitro without whose constant support and cooperation and consent in all such events we couldn't have organized such illuminating webinar thanks to everyone a small announcement before we leave for the break the feedback link for today's webinar will be shared at the end of the evening session thank you <laughs>